Um, well, Alaska has so much public lands that is managed by the federal government that we needed a voice in Washington, D.C. Um, but you might be surprised, I'm actually from Southern California. I grew up in Southern North County. And I went to school at just up the road at UC Santa Barbara. And the way I got interested in this issue was I was really upset about all the tar that was on the beach still 20 years after the huge spill in Santa Barbara. So that's how I got interested uh, in these issues. So today, um, I'm going to talk about America's Arctic Ocean. And you might not know, but we are an Arctic country. Um, and there's huge risks um, from offshore drilling and climate change in the region. Um, so this is a big map of Alaska. And you might not know, but Alaska is the largest state in landmass in the country. And if you look at the top, you can see the Chukchi Sea, and you see where Russia is. When, when uh, Governor Palin said you could actually see Russia from her backyard, she actually was, was not kidding. Russia is super close uh, to Alaska. So we're going to be talking about the Chukchi Sea and the Beaufort Sea, which are at the very top of Alaska. Um, one, one thing that's important to know is that presidents for, for decades have been interested in protecting the lands and waters in Alaska. In Alaska, and, uh, and President Carter probably designated the most wilderness, but over 100 million acres of federal land is in Alaska, which is double the size of national parks in the rest of the country. So a huge amount of land uh, in Alaska. This picture gives you a better sense of how big Alaska is. Um, if you cover it over the course of the country, it actually spans the entire country. You can see parts of Alaska here at the bottom, and it goes all the way uh, to Florida. There's about 600,000 square miles in Alaska. That's almost double the size of Texas. And it also has 1,300 miles of coastline, which is way bigger than the rest of the United States, to even put it slightly. Um, but as I said, we're going to focus today on the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas, which you see here at the top. Um, and the Arctic is an amazing place. I've, I've been lucky enough to travel there, but until you see it for yourself, it, 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 you need to see it to let it speak to you a little bit. So I'm going to show you a really short clip from a movie that was in theaters last year. It's called To the Arctic. So you're going to, it'll be like a 30 second clip to give you a better sense of the area I'm talking about. I'm Sean, and let me show you something really cool. Over the last five years, I've gotten to see and capture incredible images in the Arctic. So the Arctic is our first film in the One World One Ocean campaign. It's all about the Arctic Ocean. It's about the polar bear, which is a marine mammal. You really get a sense of how important the Arctic is, how important the Arctic Ocean is, and what an incredibly diverse ecosystem it is up there, and how tough it is. And it's getting tougher and tougher every day. We got great footage of a whole walrus colony, and one shot in particular, the walrus and this baby went straight up to the camera, basically kissed the camera, and then came back up. Now, that's another shot that I don't know if anybody's ever gotten before. If you haven't seen the movie, uh, it, was a, it was an IMAX movie that came out about, I think, a year and a half ago. It's probably some th in some theaters, but it, it's narrated by Glenn Close, and it covers the story of this mama polar bear and, and her two pups and what, it, what it's like to uh, live and be a polar bear in this region. Um, the iconic animals that, that exist in the Arctic, including uh, lots of endangered whales, there's seals, sea otters, uh, lots of birds that you probably see here in California. Actually, a lot of the animals in the Arctic migrate to other parts of the world. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the people. There are uh, native tribes that have lived there for thousands of years. This, the very far lower image is of uh, a village called Point Hope. It's right at the edge of the Arctic Ocean. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually the longest continuing village that's uh, been, been in the North America. It's been there for over 5,000 years. But you can see one of the remains of, of what the housing looked like uh, several thousand years ago. Um, the people in the Arctic, uh, they subsist off of 
the iconic species that live there, they hunt bowhead whales, um, which sometimes can be uh, up to 60 feet long. Um, and, and they really consider the water, the ocean, their garden. Um, so they don't, they don't get to grow vegetables like we do here in California. They have to subsist off the land. Um, uh, but while this area has lots of amazing wildlife and inhabitants, it's also a tremendously uh, dangerous area for uh, the weather that they experience. They have sub-zero temperatures, they have long periods of darkness. Um, in the summertime, there's 24 hours of daylight in this area, but in the winter, there's also 24 hours of darkness. Um, there are shifting ice flows, there are hurricane force winds and 20 foot seas sometimes in parts of the year. This ship um, marooned off, off the coast of the Arctic in Nome, Alaska during a big storm that just pushed it uh, right, at, right, at, right at the coast. And this is not uncommon in the Arctic. Um, and at the same time, infrastructure in this area is, um, is very, very limited. The region has no deep water ports and only a handful of small airports. And you can see, just to give you an idea, when the Gulf spill hit in, in Louisiana, you can see how much infrastructure existed within a 500 mile radius. In the Arctic, that's just not possible. And in fact, if you see it down at the body in Kodiak, Alaska, that's where the closest Coast Guard station is. It's about 1,000 miles from the Arctic. So if a spill happened in the Arctic, it would take them weeks to be able to respond to a spill. Um, so I'll give you an idea of what a spill like the Gulf spill would look like in the Arctic. It would cover, um, and you can see week one, week two, week three, it would cover the whole area of what we consider America's Arctic Ocean. But it would, the boundaries would not stop there. It would also, to the right uh, of us, we share the Beaufort Sea with Canada, and then obviously we share the Chukchi Sea with Russia. Um, so this map gives you an idea of what's happening in the Arctic. Um, with the lack of infrastructure, um, the Bush administration uh, in 2000 decided to lease a ton of area offshore. And so all the orange marks you see on here are leases that were sold to oil companies. And they can, with, with, with going through a permanent structure, can get access to drill in these areas. The really heavy orange area in the middle is on state lands. That's where the Trans-Alaska Pipeline is in Greater Bay. Um, which is where most of the, the drilling happens today. Uh, but there were over 7 million acres that were leased under the Bush administration, and that's pretty enormous considering um, that there were no leases that were owned by oil companies before that happened. So this gives you a history of, um, of, of drilling in the region. Um, in 1970, the area was first open to drilling, mainly uh, because of the fact that we had an oil shortage in this country, and um, we needed to figure out how to get oil. Because it's not economically recoverable oil, meaning they couldn't bring it to market and make money off of it, they completely, all the oil companies completely abandoned their ability to drill. And partly because it's such a risky area to drill, and it costs so much money to be able to produce the oil. Um, and I'm not going to go through detail of all the different issues, but in 2012 was the big, the latest big push for drilling. It took about 10 years for an oil company to even get permits to drill in this area because their plans were so bad and, and many environmental groups and native organizations were able to push back on, um, push back on the plan because they were not prepared to drill in the region. In 2012, and I'll go into this in more detail, um, Shell Oil attempted to drill top holes, meaning they didn't actually go down to where the oil was, they just did the initial drilling to get down below the sea uh, surface, and they failed immensely at this activity. Two of their rigs were <coughs> um, They've been fined by the, by the Justice Department as well as the Environmental Protection Agency for a lot of their errors, and I'll go into that. In, in more detail. And just recently, they, they pulled out again for 2014 because of some other litigation. Um, this is just to give you a sense of the amount of litigation I'm talking about. These are all the current pending cases just regarding Shell's drilling plans. Shell wanted to move forward so badly that they did a preemptive case. And what that means is they decided 
they felt their claims were so good that they sued the environmental organizations. Um, and this has been done only a few times by corporations, but they decided to sue us because they felt their claims were so solid. So they wanted a judge to say, look, our claims are so good that we that they can stand up in court. So they preempted us. Um, this reminds you of what happens, what the riskiness is of, of drilling in the region. This was the Deepwater Horizon spill. And the Deepwater Horizon spill did stop uh, drilling for a few years. Um, but, as I mentioned, Shell came back in 2012. And this is just a list of a few of the problems that they had. Um, and I'm going to show you a quick video that actually goes into more detail. The ship in the right is the Kulik. And the Kulik, uh, Shell had two drill ships that they sent, or drill rigs that they sent up to the Arctic. The Kulik grounded off of Kodiak Island in southern Alaska when it was trying to leave the Arctic. It went, ran aground. And uh, it took days, actually, for them to be able to, to, to uh, get the ship out. Um, but it, it's complete. They've now junked it because it got so much damage from just trying to get up to the Arctic. Um, some of the other things that happened, their other drill ship also grounded and then it got caught for 16 safety violations. Um, the spill response bars are required to have all this extra equipment when they go up um, to do the type of activity that they want to do. But the spill bar never got certified by the Coast Guard. Um, after Deepwater Horizon, they're required to have a containment zone. So if the spill happens, they're able to cap, the, cap it from, uh, from, from getting too big. And it got crashed just during a test off, off the coast of Washington. So, um, I'll show you a quick video because Rachel Maddow does a much better uh, giving you an idea of what happened in Iowa. Okay, our economy did the fall. It's getting more into America. Big plans has been high level executive for the Shell Oil Corporation for 29 long, glorious, and profitable years. He is the executive vice president of exploration and commercial for Shell's Upstream Americas division, which is a fancy way of saying that he drills the Americas for Shell. Last year, Shell's drilling operations in the Americas had a big boost when the federal government gave Shell specifically the okay to start drilling in the Arctic. Lots of oil companies wanted that, but Shell is the one who got the go ahead. And it was David Lawrence who was put in charge of that. As Shell was gearing up to start drilling in the Arctic, Mr. Lawrence gave an interview to Dow Jones in which he predicted that drilling in the Arctic would be, quote, relatively easy. That turned out to be relatively wrong. After getting the permits to start drilling, Shell just made a hash of it. These are the two rigs they sent up there to start drilling. The one on the left is called the Discoverer, the one on the right is called the Kulik. Well, last summer, the Discoverer nearly ran aground after dragging its anchor through the Aleutian Islands. Four months after that, it had a fire break out in its engine room. Then the U.S. Coast Guard boarded it and found more than a dozen violations involving the rig's safety and pollution equipment. For example, the main engine piston's cooling water was contaminated with sludge and oil. The crew was dealing with it by skimming off the oil with a radar and a bucket. That's nice. Nice. Uh, safety violations led the Coast Guard to essentially detain that rig in port, and then they referred it to the Justice Department to see if Shell was actually guilty of criminal violations there, too. So that was the discoverer. The other Shell drilling rig is the Kulik. And the Kulik did not just almost run aground, it did run aground. Earlier this year, the Kulik lost power, went to drift, and eventually crashed into an island off the coast of southern Alaska. Stranded there for days before they were finally able to drive it away. Well, there's no news to report tonight on the Kulik. The news is that it, too, is now facing a federal criminal investigation. Coast Guard officials saying today that they completed their investigation into the Kulik. They've now asked the Justice Department to review potential violations that they turned up. So both of Shell's two Arctic drilling rigs, the only two they sent up there, now find themselves under the eye of the United States Justice Department. But remember, drilling in the Alaska Arctic is relatively easy. This is probably a good time to tell you that earlier this week, Mr. Darwin, we've got this, our picture is going to be easy peasy, and I said he is stepping down from Shell after 29 years with the company. There's long been an effort in this country to open up the Arctic for drilling. Let's let the oil companies run wild up there. Nobody knows how to do it, it's no better than they do. So far, one company has been allowed to do it. Both of its rings are facing federal investigations. The executive in charge is out of a job, and Shell has announced that it is calling off all of its drilling operations in the Arctic for the rest of the year. Why is this not a bigger story? 
Um, even though a lot of these people don't live in the yard, but they understand the implications of not protecting this area uh, for the future. So if you want to learn more, um, I really encourage you to check out our website. Lots of environmental groups across the country are working on this issue. And uh, it, you can go to our website to find out more. We also have some postcards. So if I've moved you enough to want to take action, um, feel free to come check out one of our postcards. And thank you so much for inviting me to today. Wilderness, or which couldn't be considered wilderness. And they had um, pretty much 
decided that large tracts of land couldn't be included as potential in this area because of road claims that were in those areas. Um, land that's managed by Bureau of Land Management potentially can be used for mining, drilling. Um, it can be multiple uses, you know, off-road vehicles, pushing, you know, hunting, fishing, all kinds of exploration. Um, but the government will, will give out leases to develop the land for, uh, research, for natural resources. So um, we went out, and I went out as an intern, and we were photographing road claims and finding a lot of things that were claimed as roads that would be like a cow path or an old two-track trail that was left behind by pioneers who had um, traveled through that area and left kind of a long-lasting long impression, but it wasn't a re regularly used road. Um, we would find river courses that were also claimed as roads. So we were photographing all those things to have everything documented and you know, getting our lights to run to using our, our map, our relief maps to figure out where we were because it really, we were in various areas and we were you know, off, out, outside of civilization. When I first started working at SUA, the estimated wilderness in that state was somewhere around a little over 3 million acres. While I was working with them, we had expanded the number by proving, you know, on foot surveying the land to 5.7 million acres. And it was part of a campaign making bumper stickers saying, protect 5.7 million acres of wilderness. Well, people continued to survey the land, and, and today they're at 9.5 million acres. So it was originally estimated to be just about 3 million acres, and this was in the late 1990s. And over these years, just based on grassroots activism, just regular people that you know, are um, volunteering, going out and photographing these lands to, to um, figure out this bigger number. There's actually over 9.5 you know, million acres in the state of Utah that is roadless, that is undeveloped, that is pristine. Um, and there are a number of people that are very interested in trying to protect a lot of this wilderness. But still, the ultimate goal is to protect all that wilderness quality land and keep it in that pristine state. Why would we want to take such a huge area of land and, and keep it protected as wilderness? Um, there, there are a lot of things you can do on wilderness <laughs> land, and this also keeps you from being able to do some things on wilderness protected land. Um, so if it's, uh, you know, some of the things you can do, you can go out and you can go fishing, you can go hunting, you can canoe, you can hike, you can explore. But you can't bring mechanized vehicles. Um, you can't develop the land. There's no um, radio towers. Um, um, and uh, if, if under some levels of protection, they can grandfather in leases on that land, where um, you know there are leases for grazing and there's leases for um, natural resource extraction. And it's designated as a national monument, you can really keep those activities in. But you can't bring in new roads, so it kind of excludes most of those activities. Um, so really, primarily, will keep out a lot of the, the resource development side of the um, So just to show you some pictures of some of these areas. Well, why would you want to um, protect it? Some of the um, reasons that we might be interested in protecting these areas is that these are areas where well, rivers are cutting through. You have Canyonlands region, which I'll show you a little bit later, where you have um, the convergence of several rivers and the rivers that are cutting through all kinds of canyon areas. This protects that watershed, so it provides clean water. This is a, one of nature's ways of cleansing water, which provides drinking water and irrigation water for people downstream. Also, um, by having um, land that's undeveloped, this also helps with the carbon cycle. So there's carbon capture in these areas. There's, um, it, so this helps cleaner air, maintain high quality air for us. Um, and of course, there's the incredible experiences of um, experiencing the dark night sky. Um, being in places where you have solitude, where you experience um, kind of a, um, a, a spiritual experience of getting away and being in quiet areas where you explore and you really can't see um, development or, you know, and you're basically visiting, but you're not leaving a, a, a long-term impression in that area. Um, other things is archaeological discovery and scientific discovery. So we have places like in Canyonlands where we have about 12,000 years of um, archaeological information that's like this open library that can, there's so much discovery that we can experience. I'm going to show you guys a video 
um, that is uh, narrated by Robert Redford. He, uh, he spent time, he lives in Utah, and he, um, I think he really fell in love with Utah when he uh, made the movie Bush Cassidy and Sundance did, and then he created a, a, an area called Sundance and started the Sundance Film Festival in Utah, but he's an advocate for wilderness in Utah as well. And part of the area that's proposed for wilderness is actually where Bush Cassidy and Sundance hit, hit, hit out in the 1890s. So it's uh, areas that are just, you know, you can get lost in. We're going to go ahead and watch this 20 minutes video. River 
river areas or unused, you know, area to track trail kind of areas. If this area was designated as a national monument, um, it, it's all that area, 1.4 million acres is roadless, it would still really not exclude that much proper vehicle use. There's a, there are, um, it, would, it would still keep about 86% of off-road vehicle use intact. So where there are used roads for off-road vehicle that can't really be designated as a wilderness area, it's too impacted. So the majority of areas where off-road vehicles would go would still be available. Um, off-road vehicles, if you could go back, maybe you know, a few generations back, it was really like families going out on cheap excursions, but it's turned into something much larger. We saw in that video where you have large groups that are really trying to do more extreme, um, extreme off-road vehicles that are using extreme vehicles and trying to um, go into areas that are really difficult to traverse. And so some of the um, landscapes that you know were are a little bit more um, iconic or more at risk now because of, there's more of that extreme um, approach to it and you know there are the um, you know, uh, large groups going in to break the boundaries basically. All these areas are in the Greater Canyon so. and I just want to show you guys a couple pictures of the night sky. Um, Of over 280 miles of rivers, uh, River Cut Canyon and River Flow through this area. It's an important watershed area. You start Canyon, White Canyon. And this um, shows some of the archaeological um, uh, findings in the area. There are cliff dwellings, stone towers, granaries, petroglyphs, pictographs, scattered stone working sites. And so there's all these wonderful traces and pieces of evidence of, of former people in this area. And so much to discover and enjoy. And here's some pictures of the night sky. And certainly living in Southern California, you don't get to see nice skies like this. When the sky is filled with stars. Um, one last thing I want to share is just the number of animals that live in this area. Often it's assumed that when you're in dryland and desert regions, that it's, in fact, sometimes people will consider it a place that's like a, a, an area that has no uses, no life. A great area for um, maybe putting waste. <laughs> um, and, and within this area, you have deer, mountain lion, bear, bighorn sheep, pronghorn, pronghorn um, elk. So there's quite a variety. We've got hundreds of species of birds, smaller mammals, reptiles, including seven threatened and endangered species within the area. So I want to close with um, inviting you, if you're interested to know more and get involved, also. Um, uh, I do have uh, information about some Utah Wilderness Alliance and also a, um, a campaign where they're trying to get support to get this area designated as a national monument as they continue to try and increase um, support to um, preserve the 9.4 to 9.5 million acres of wilderness in Utah. Thank you. Well, we live in a beautiful country. Okay, we have more things to give away, and then we're going to have a little bit of time for discussion, questions. Um, so, back to associated students. By the way, I have a sign-up sheet if anyone needs to sign up. Um, Yeah, there's not a, an incredible amount of tourism that goes on in the Arctic uh, currently because it is, um, 
It is a very uh, hard place to get to. It's actually a very expensive place to get to. To fly from California costs you several thousand dollars to get up there. Um, but in Barrow, which is at the very tip uh, of Alaska, there is travel. There are cruise ships that actually do go into the Arctic now, as I, as I mentioned there, uh, because the ice is melting, it's a, a little bit easier to, to travel in those areas, but it's only a few cruise ships a year. Most of the travel, and for those of you that have been to Alaska, I'm guessing you've been to Southern Alaska, the Tongass National Forest, some of the videos you, you all got, is one of the most beautiful places I've probably ever been. Um, it, it's where you see the, the iconic glaciers in Alaska or in Southern Alaska, and then Denali National Park is at Mount McKinley, if you've heard of that, is also one of the more iconic areas. But yeah, thousands of people go there a year. The cruise ships, most of the cruises you do in Alaska would be in, in southern Alaska. I have a question. Uh, regarding the petroleum, you said Shell is the only company that went up there. Are they, are they based because they lobby for those contracts? How's that working? Is who's next if Shell doesn't want it? Sure. Um, Shell, uh, Shell owns the most leases right now. Um, there are several other oil companies that actually own leases. ConocoPhillips is one. Um, in, in Canada, Exxon uh, ha has leases. Um, a lot of the oil companies have pulled out of America's Arctic because they've seen what, what's happened with Shell. Um, companies like Total, if you've heard of them in France, they've said they don't, they're never going to invest in Arctic drilling because it's just too expensive. Uh, to do it. Shell spent on their program that failed about $5 billion to try and get up there. Yes? Uh, I've been to Alaska three times and uh, the cruise ships are pretty good. Uh, everything that goes in comes out and I have a couple of friends that actually work up there during the season Yeah. and everything that's shipped in is shipped out, even the trash. Uh, there's no dumps up there, there you can't dump anything and they're really strict about it in the, the communities and everybody watches there's nobody going to get away with anything up there so any place that people live it's uh there's eyeballs looking so, there's lots of laws. yeah there's lots of people watching all, all this laws, activity if you make the laws there's gonna be a lot of people watching to make sure people are by them sure. that includes the oil companies yep. Um, I understand that the nature and environment is a very beautiful thing. It's a really great experience. But from an economic point of view, what are the what's the reason in preserving so much of this land? But, you know. Sure. If you want to look at kind of like the the, the fast early return I, um, rather than long term, you know, financial benefits. Um, there's the uh, outdoor recreation industry is huge in Utah, and that's actually um, where you get some of the, the wealthier and you know businesses that are, are supporting wilderness. It's because they're an outdoor rec kind of um, business, and, and you have these gateway communities, like was mentioned in the film, like Moab is the gateway to some of these wilderness areas, where that's become a big part of the income for those communities. Um, Let's see, um, there's one other one that's not on the top of my head. Um, I'm not going to remember it, but I guess if you're looking uh, long term, um, when, you, when you lose ecosystems, you usually have to replace the services they were providing in some way, and so that becomes a long term cost. So, for example, if we have any kind of water pollution, or losing our water filtration and cleansing processes through that area, then we have to do something to replace that. We have to build some kind of water filtration system or you know, water cleaning system to provide clean water, drinking water downstream. And so we look at that as like when we're, when we're considering the costs and benefits of preserving an area versus developing it, you know, we may make, initially make some money through, through drilling or, or mining that area, but then we look at long-term costs and how do we deal with the water quality for the next few generations, and we have to, we have to invest the money that nature was doing that service for free for us, for cleansing that water. So that, that's those are some of the things that might be put into a cost-benefit cost analysis long-term. And then you also get into larger-scale cost-benefit when we're looking at preserving an area for air quality or for um, looking at greenhouse effects and or not necessarily greenhouse effects but carbon capture in that area and you know looking at how are we having to pay for um, 
global climate change, you know, worse than the ways that we're having to pay for that a little bit more in terms of storm protection, um, extreme weather events, droughts, and, you know, by losing some of these areas, we're kind of throwing things off balance and we have to pay for it on the back side. So there's some things that are considered long-term looking at the financial spreadsheet. Um, Good question, though. Um, and let me actually throw one other thing in there, too. Um, a lot of the, um, well, I didn't show that, but in, in the Greater Can Canyonlands area, most of those areas are being considered for um, tar sand development and for um, other oil extraction and for mining purposes in potash. And um, for, for the most part, they've surveyed the land to see what kind of natural resources there are in there. If, you, if we were to extract those materials and, and rely on them, you're only looking at a matter of like maybe four weeks worth of, of fuel. So it's not like a, a real long-term um, addition to the economy. It's not like, you know, they'd be small-scale kind of uh, gains versus the long-term damage. Can I add to the Yeah. Um, if you can show or if you can model that it is economically less viable over the long run, then shouldn't we be using that as a way of persuading people? I don't see why people need good bills in order for the government to force people to not go in there. Mm -hmm. if, if, if it was economically not viable, why do businesses want to go in there and take this type of money? <laughs> Yeah, um, great question. That, that is one of those struggles that we have when you're, you've got two different kind of uh, mindsets when you've got one that's really looking at maybe the, the five-year plan, the one five-year plan, and which you're going to make in that term, you know, in that period versus you know, ecologically oriented, you know, you're thinking in terms of, you know, the next hundred years, the next thousand years. But that's, you know, you, you're trying to bring these two kind of thinking processes together is kind of tough. But we, we've involved in some ways where we do cost benefit analysis before we you know put in a piece of environmental legislation and we we start looking long term at like the effects of the clean air act how's that going to save us money but yeah i think when, when it comes to wilderness designation it might not be it might be a little bit harder to run some of those populations than looking at you know um, you know some kind of air quality improvement in a city like that was it really say we'll see the improvements in 12 years we'll see we'll see return on investment in 12 years but you know with, with wilderness we uh, maybe a little bit harder to say in 12 years we'll see the return on investment you know. i hope that answers your question go ahead yeah Lori. Uh, right. i got i got two questions <laughs> uh, one we mentioned moab several times in big way moab is a is a radioactive uranium superfund site which off roaders use. Um, and I don't think that's where they want to have a wilderness area. No, and it's no. used for off road almost exclusively. Right. No, that, so that's, they brought more that's up, they brought part of off road vehicles up several times. That's what the only place they use. Yeah. The other thing is, why does the ARP and the uh, people of the ADA and the Wounded Warriors against the Wilderness Designation. Okay, so there's a whole thing And the there. Mountain Bike Association yeah. also. So, Moab is a big off-road vehicle area and mountain biking, and it's, that's, the recreation there is a huge part of their income. Um, I mentioned it's a gateway kind of city. It's close to, uh, um, like, the access, like, the door to going into the other side of recreation, which would be, you know, your, your uh, I guess you're part of your kind of recreation and your, your hiking and, and, and camping and that kind of side of, of the recreation. So, but they they stand to gain not just from the industry that's right there, the outdoor rec industry, but also that people go through that doorway, basically that gateway to get into in terms of the wilderness or potential wilderness area. But one thing that you also brought up is um, access, basically. I think mean, that's what you're saying. You talk about American Facilities Act and, and talking about people that are going to have a more difficult, challenging time accessing some of these areas. So a wilderness area has you no, know, it doesn't have interior access. You have a lot of roads that are going to be coming right up to that wilderness area. But maybe to access some of these incredible places, you know, you, you're not going to be able to do it if you're in a wheelchair. You're not going to be able to see it if you can't drive right up to it. And that, that's, you know, that's part of the, I guess, part of the compromise there is that, you know, one of the questions is, should we have access to everything? Is one of the values of the area that 
there isn't a lot of access, so it doesn't change. You know, so it's kind of preserved in its primitive form. To be able to have the opportunity, not everyone maybe can have the opportunity. Some people will be happy to know that it's just there, even if they never see it, never go to it. Um, but yeah, it comes up to kind of that, that question, should everything be accessible? Should we make everything accessible to everyone? I appreciate that, that so many places are accessible. You know, I have family members that can't walk. And so I love that we have so many places that can provide access for my family member. But, uh, but then I still appreciate that there are places that aren't just for us, but they're for wildlife, and that we can kind of, kind of take a peek and see that. You know. <laughs> Well, I've taken many wounded warriors back in that area, and uh, they don't have any other access other than that. They fought, have, and have given parts of their body, and they own that. Yeah, well, they're, they're, by the wilderness designation, they're actually denying them access to go into something that they have given parts of their body for. Well, they're not providing access, I guess you could say, right? I don't know about denying it. Not, it's not being provided. Right. No mechanical, no wheelchairs, no scooters, no off-road devices, no nothing. Right, right. No they can't walk. Yeah. Yeah. It's a gross challenge. I think there's a question. Yeah. And do you want to go ahead? Yeah, you you can go ahead for a I have a quick question for you. I've sure. been to um, Anchorage and we drove to home. We did a lot of fishing. Yeah. Uh, what other place would you recommend? Because we definitely want to go back. It's gorgeous in Alaska. Yeah, Bristol Bay is actually an area um, in southern Alaska that's, that's known for their fishing. It actually is the largest salmon fishery um, in the country. Um, and so that area, uh, but Homer is, is actually probably one of your best areas uh, for fishing. In the Arctic, there's not a lot of commercial, there's actually no commercial fishing uh, that, that occurs today, but uh, Homer and um, down in southern Alaska and the Thomas. Uh, well, the Arctic, there's no commercial fishing that goes on uh, offshore right now, um, but there is a lot of fishing in, in lots of the villages, uh, areas. Um, Kotzebue is right above the Arctic Circle, and um, there's lots of, there's, there's a gateway to get into the National Petroleum Reserve from that area, and there's lots of, I believe there's lots of fishing. Um, and then in BLM lands, in, in the interior of Alaska, there's the Black River and, and different areas. But um, I mean, we have a we have a website called Tour the Tongass, um, and that has a lot of information on some of the tourism areas. Um, so you should check out our website. There, there is information on that. And I also have another question. I, we're, we're planning a vacation in Utah. So, um, which of the of the um, the parks would you recommend? Like your top three? You know, like it's I or Zion National Park. Park. Okay. The National Park yeah. is the narrow site. That's my favorite. You want to go when it's warm because you're walking you hike through the water. And if you want to see the full hike, it's all it's a full day hike, and you need ropes to like you know kind of traverse down certain areas. But you can like with your family, you can just enter in at the base of the hike, and you can go up as far as you want to go. And you don't need to have equipment or anything. But it goes into narrow slot canyons that are just gorgeous. That's my favorite hike. No, you're next too. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a big question. So Bryce, it's really beautiful. You haven't been there as well. So gorgeous, yeah. And um, yeah, and then um, I guess arches. Yeah, my, my father's favorite is arches. So that's where you can see delicate arch, which is really big, especially when you saw license plate. Yeah, and you can you hike down and get underneath it and look up, and it's huge. And you know, feeling like you're going to fall down. But for a lot of people, that's maybe number one. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Question over here, and then we'll go over there. I have a question uh, for the lady from Alaska. <laughs> um, Lee Stevens, Professor um, Kaplan, is my professor and student of his. Um, two questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, if we have time. First, um, as far as the, um, the growth of the shipping uh, routes through the, uh, the Arctic area, has there been any approach by your organization either to our government or to foreign governments to try to intercede with that? Um, shipping is <coughs> something that's happening at the international level. There's an, a body that actually oversees all, um, all the Arctic nations. It was created uh, by an individual from, or by our State Department for, from the U.S. side. It's called the Arctic Council. 
and they're debating uh, shipping uh, issues at, at that level. They're talking about things like waste, what, what the ships should be required, because right now there's no regulations on shipping that goes through those areas, unlike in other parts of the world, because most of the shipping is so, is so new. There's also things going on at the uh, international, um, it's called the IMF, and my organization doesn't specifically work on shipping issues, but we are following it. We have an environmental justice program, um, which means we work with a lot of the communities on the ground. Lots of communities are really concerned because they're now seeing ships that are coming right up against their shore, which is really impacting um, subsistence and where, where the whales are migrating to. Um, so there's a lot of work being done to regulate what's going on with shipping, but no shipping, uh, no regulations have been put in place either by the US or some of these other Arctic nations. Um, there's a lot of environmental groups working on it. So if you're more interested in that, I could connect you with some of the groups more deep second, on that. Second question. Sure. Um, you had said that Shell has pulled out, kind of seeing it as a dead loss, and that other- Well, they pulled out for this year, just this okay. year. Yeah. But you had said that there's been sort of an exodus of other companies. Yeah. So with that, if it's seen across the board by the oil industry as not economically viable, what would that hold for the future of your organization? Or would you guys, would you be out of business? Or would you we wouldn't be out of issue? business. Um, and just to, be, just to be a little more clear about what's going on in the Arctic, there are lots of companies that are, are looking at the Arctic in, in other countries. Um, a, you know, a lot of what's going on is Shell pulled out for this year, be, partly because of the litigation, at least that's what they claim. Um, in the 90s is when they decided it was not economically viable. I don't, I don't think that that decision has, it's not closed the door yet on whether it's still not economically viable. Um, but there are investors and oil companies who've said that it isn't, just not every oil company out there. Um, my organization works on a wide variety of issues. This just the Arctic Ocean just happens to be one of them. We've been fighting for decades to get parts of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge protected it as wilderness. Oil companies were um, exploring offshore, so there's never been production offshore in Alaska. But in the 90s, um, in the 70s to the 90s, Shell and some other companies uh, had some exploration wells offshore, but they abandoned those wells because they weren't able to bring it. To the market. They were the only reason why I asked that is because in your presentation you had jumped from 1970 yeah. to 2001 and you left out of two decades. And quite frankly, I questioned some of the objectivity because it seemed to be sort of an indictment of the Bush administration, skipping over all that well, other period. And in my presentation, it went from 1970 to 1990, partly because that was... It was to 2001. Well, and then to 2001, because that's when they started leasing areas again. Because what had happened is they relinquished the leases. Leases are, are available to oil companies for a 10-year period, usually. Um, and so when those expire, they're relinquished, meaning the government owns them again. So they didn't start leasing them again until the Bush administration. So. We had the Nixon administration where they sold some leases. Then the leases, they didn't develop on those leases, meaning they never brought the oil to production. And so those, link, those leases were then bought back by the government. Now, no president since Nixon, until we got to President Bush in 2001, actually leased areas offshore. They're not required to lease areas offshore, and they make a decision every five years about whether they're gonna lease areas offshore. And I focused on 2001 to 2013, because that's been the period that's been the most aggressive as far as when offshore development has happened. Um, there's lots of materials that go into more depth as to year by year exactly what's happened in the Arctic. And if you want more details, I'm happy to send it to you. Okay. Well, thank you very